saying how glad I am uh, to join you courtesy of the invitation of the president of the Pan-African Parliament. And let me also say how glad I am to have the opportunity to address members of the Pan-African Parliament. And let me also say how glad I am to do so on the occasion of the commemoration of 60 years since the founding of the Organization of African Unity, which is now the African Union. I've had the advantage of listening to the presentation that have been made. I've had the advantage of listening to the history that has been given about the beginnings of the Pan-African Congress in the 19th century and how the Pan-African movement did uh, give impetus to the struggle for independence culminating in the independence of Ghana in 1957. The history is important to the extent that it contextualizes our understanding of the Pan-African movement and contextualizing the movement beyond the continent of Africa to include Africans in the diaspora wherever they are. Many of us will know that exactly today, 60 years ago, 32 heads of state government assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, on the occasion of the creation of the OAU, now the African Union. And those of you who have had the advantage of reading the speeches or listening to the speeches that were delivered on that day, it cannot be denied that they were imbued with the spirit of Pan-Africanism. But even then, it must never be forgotten that when the heads of states met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, there were already two streams of African leaders that were present there. One stream of the leaders was the Casablanca group, led by the Osagi for Kwame Nkrumah, who took the view that Africa could only immunize ourselves from the diabolical machinations of the colonial powers by immediate unity. There was also the, Cas the Monrovia group, which took the view that African unity ought to be gradual, and that it is through gradualism that necessary traction would be achieved. Indeed, commentators now say that the creation of the Organization of African Unity was a victory for the Monrovia group. Victory because immediate unity as conceived, articulated by Kwame Nkrumah, among others, did not take place culminating in the creation of an organization whose weakness was legendary. And ultimately, of course, even in her weakness, it cannot be denied that under the aegis of the Organization of African Unity, a number of African countries which were still under the shackles of colonialism were held towards liberation. Many of you will remember that Dar es Salaam, in a manner of speaking, became the mecca for the African struggle. And many countries such as Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, uh, South and West African Republic, now Namibia, were liberated through the activities of African stalwarts organized from Dar es Salaam. So today, when you ask me the question, which I will answer shortly, how can the Pan-African Parliament be used to energize the spirit of Pan-Africanism? Today, there are many Pan-African institutions, and these institutions operate under the aegis of the African Union. And many of you will remember that the transition from the Organization of African Unity to the African Union was informed by the realization that Africa needed to up the ante in her struggle to create an environment that would energize the Pan-African agenda. That is why in 1999, it became necessary to do the transition. And it is not true that 
African Union was simply a rose by some other name. If you read the history and look at the environment during which it was created, the leaders were informed and animated by the desire to create a body that would move in a direction hitherto unprecedented, that it would be the engine, or if you may, the prime mover that would catapult the continent of Africa into the orbit of political, economic, cultural, technological, and other development. The question then to be posed is whether the African Union and her institutions have indeed achieved their desired goal and whether institutions such as yours, the Pan-African Parliament, have achieved their desired goal. If I am to read a report to you and to be candid and unapologetic, you have performed below par. Your performance has not injected the spirit of Pan-Africanism in the manner that was, it was contemplated. And that is true of many Pan-African institutions, including the African Union herself. To start, even at the risk of being petty, the Pan-African Union headquarters is built by the Chinese. And the last time I checked, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And if you look at the budget of the African Union, anything between 60 and 70% of that budget is catered for by foreign powers. In other words, they are both visible and invisible channels via which the colonial powers continue to control African institutions. If you go outside of the African Union herself and you go into the African Development Bank, you will discover that after Nigeria, the second highest investor in the African Development Bank is the United States of America. There are 88 shareholders today and all the major European powers, including others outside of Europe, such as Japan, are shareholders. One can dare say, even at the risk of irritating those who occupy those offices, that the African Development Bank is only an African Development Bank in name. If that be the case, we must then ask ourselves whether an institution such as yours is indeed one that, as it is presently constituted, one that is made in the spirit of Pan-Africanism. And I dare say, no. If you went into any street in Africa, including South Africa, where you are sitting, and asked 10 people whether they know the Pan-African Parliament and whether they know what it does, eight out of 10 do not know which means that you have not visited nor gained resident, residence in the hearts and minds of Africa. Indeed, the very manner in which your membership is constituted is in many ways undemocratic. Many of you are chosen by your parliaments, many of you are chosen by your parties, and many Africans do not know that you exist. But be that as it may, you are a beginning, and I see the Pan-African Parliament as the early days, the embryonic stages of moving towards a more democratic representation of Africans within the African continent. Today, many of your deliberations and many of your decisions do not bind any country. And to the extent that they don't, they are undermining the very value that you could add to the Pan-African agenda. You know, and you are aware, that today one of the most important things in the continent of Africa by way of pursuing economic development is Africa Agenda 2063. Africa Agenda 2063 came in the year 2013, and it was fundamentally a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980, whose DNA was informed by the realization that if Africa and Africans do not trade amongst themselves, then the continent would continue to be a hunting ground for world powers. Africa Agenda 2063 is therefore in many ways 
the continent's interpretation, or if you may, reinterpretation initially of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, given an African flavor. Today, we are in the 10th year of Africa Agenda 2063. And the question must be asked, what have we achieved during that period? And the truth be told, our achievements have been modest, but they are modesty notwithstanding. What is important is that we must remind ourselves that modesty itself is indeed the beginning of the realization of greater things if indeed we want to achieve what is desirable. In order to ensure that Africa Agenda 2063 realizes her goals and the goals that will benefit the continent of Africa, many of you will know that indeed Africa has made several steps, some before Africa Agenda 2063, some after, in different areas. You will be familiar with the Maputo Declaration, whose agenda was to ensure that women are integrated in the struggle for development of Africa. You will be familiar with the 2001 Abuja Declaration on Health, You'll be familiar with the Yamasukuru Declaration in 1988 that deals with the freeing of the air, this airspace. You'll be familiar with the Malabo Declaration, which sets out how we deal with unconstitutional changes of government. You'll be familiar with the, the Kigali Declaration to ensure that we have free movement of persons. In other words, Africa is a forest of declarations which are honored in breach. And outside of that, every year, Africa sets unto ourselves different agenda. And you will remember that at one time we said that we would silence the guns. And it came to pass in the year 2021 that we did not silence the guns. And as I speak to you now, guns are to be had in different parts of South of Africa. If it is not in the southern Cameroons, we can hear the guns in the Sahel. We can still hear them in Mali. We can hear them in Burkina Faso. We can hear them in Guinea-Bissau. We can hear them in Eastern Congo. We can hear them in Central African Republic. We can still hear them in Tigray. We can hear them in Sudan. We can hear them in the northern part of Mozambique. We can hear them in Somali. And I'm putting it to you that the Pan-African agenda can never be realized if we do not resolve conflicts. And therefore, one of the things that Africa and your parliament must do is that you must be in the forefront of resolution of conflicts. Right now, there is a conflict in Sudan. And right now, what do I hear? that the conflict is being resolved in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, through the midwifery of the United States of America and Saudi Arabia. The question to be asked, where is the Pan-African Parliament? Where is the African Union? Where are the wrecks? These are the questions that we must ask. We must also ask ourselves as a continent, why is it that some of us are moving outside of the continent of Africa? I remember as a young student of history when the entire Africa had leaders who loved her. I can remember if you left Southern Africa and you left people like Sobukwe, like Mandela, like Nyoma, like Michelle, like Neto, like Andy Mbahaman, Toivo Ya Toivo, like Seret Sekama, and you went to the western part of Africa and met people like Nkrumah, you met people like Nam Diazikiwe, you met people like uh, Moyo, but like Amilka Cabral, Modibo Keita, and you went to the north, and you came to East Africa before you went to the north, and you met people like Nyerere, Obote, Kenyatta, Kaunda in Central Africa, and indeed people uh, like uh, 
uh, in, in the northern part of Africa. They were Arabs at that time, but they were first Africans. And I remember people like Gamal Abdel Nasser. I remember Habib Bogiba of Tunisia. I remember King Hassan of Morocco hosting a meeting in Casablanca in 1960. I remember Mokhtar Al Dadai in Mauritania. I remember Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria. Today, the Maghreb is moving away. On the 19th day of May, they met in Sham el Sheikh in Egypt, and they warned Ethiopia about building the Grand Renaissance Dam. There is something that is happening, and I would want members of your parliament from Egypt to tell you, do they think that they are members of the Pan-African Parliament? I want the Tunisians to tell you, are they members of the African Parliament if they are expelling fellow Africans? I want the Moroccans to tell you, whether they are members of the Pan-African Parliament, if they are seeking to be members of the European Union, I want the Algerians to tell you whether they are members of the Pan-African Parliament. Let us not be nice to them. Let us ask them questions because this is a matter where choices must be made and neutrality is betrayal. And beyond that, I'm asking the African Parliament to remember that Africa can only thrive through trade. We now have headquartered in Accra, Ghana, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. If the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is going to work, it is only going to work if we think as Africans. And remember the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma said, you are not an African because you are born in Africa, but you are an African because Africa is born in you. You who are present in this assembly, is Africa born in you or you are simply an African because you are born in Africa? These are the questions that are on the table. And if our continent is going to grow in different sectors, whether it's in the pharmaceutical sector, so that we are going to make our own vaccines, so that we in the agricultural sector, we do not rely on Monsanto and Syngenta, so that in the technology sector where we are dealing with the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, we are not depending on Google and other Western uh, instruments and other Western companies, so that we are going to depend in the area of aviation on planes that are made in Africa, so that we are going to produce our lithium and make our battery, so that we are not going to have Rio Tinto and Glencore, so that we are not going to have Coca-Cola buying all our waters, so that we are not going to have Kentucky Fried Chicken, so that we are not going to have Coca-Cola and Kenchik democracies, which are controlled from the West, so that we are not going to mimic Western systems of government. You, the Pan-African Parliament, must now ask yourself the fundamental question. The fundamental question, whether your meetings are merely jamborees at which you deliver pro forma speeches, or whether your meetings are sites for the deliberation of things that are critical to the continent of Africa. One can go on and on, but I want to remind you, fellow Africans, that the Pan-African spirit must never die. I can still hear those immortal words of Kwame Nukuruma, that Africa will only grow if she is united. She will only grow if her institutions are strong. She will only grow if her institutions are funded by herself. And I can also hear those immortal words of Julius Kambaragi Nyerere, spoken on the sixth day of March 1997, telling his audience that their generation had one task, the task of liberating Africa from the chains of colonialism but that our generation has a duty to liberate Africa from the chains, not only of neo-colonialism, but from the chains of economic dependence. Let us remind ourselves that when we are feeding and suckling from the breasts of IMF, suckling from the breasts of the World Bank, after we have taken the nectar what lies beneath is poison. Let us remind ourselves that when we are being helped, let us not forget that beneath the benevolence, there is malevolence. 
So Pan-Africanism will only be helped if your institution becomes stronger, if your institution is funded. So on this 60th, 60th anniversary of Africa and the African Union, I am now charging you, let this be your day of the Pentecost, when the spirit of Pan-African Pan-Africanism descends into your hearts and minds. So if you come from Angola, go out to Angola and tell your president that you want more powers for the Pan-African Parliament. If you are from Kenya, go out. If you are from Ghana, go out and make sure that you Pan-African Parliament is not described by historians as a toothless bulldog. If you are a dog, acquire teeth. And if you acquire teeth, let be, them be the teeth of steel. It is only in that way that Pan-Africanism will be given meaning so that Africans in the mother continent and those in the diaspora, whether they are in the Caribbean or in the United States of America or in Europe, they may know that they have a home to come to. Africa can be great, but it will not be great if Africans are made to move from symposium to symposia to workshop to colloquia and to meetings whose only great to fame is that they generate heat without producing light. Africa can rise. And we must remember these immortal words of the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma. We may have differences, but we must never emphasize those differences. We must de-emphasize them because our diversity is a cultural mosaic, which if we use well, it is the symphony that will create the music of Pan-Africanism and Africans will be a people who are respected in the world. I wish you a good Africa Day on this 60th anniversary of the celebration of the OAU and the African Union. God bless you.